Hello, students. You're welcome to yet another history class. I remain Mr. Ilori. Today, in history, we'll be considering the topic, meaning and origin of legitimate trade. Meaning and origin of legitimate trade. Now, the term legitimate trade refers to the trade in commodities between Africans and European merchants immediately after the abolition of slave trade. Now, this was trade in commodities between Africans and European merchants. Merchants also synonymous to traders, but merchants are successful traders. So immediately after the abolition of slave trade, it was a trade where African raw materials, especially cash crops, were exchanged for European goods. Such commodities included palm produce, rubber, cotton, skin, cocoa, and gun. This produce were in high demand in Europe as a result of the Industrial Revolution. I repeat, the commodities that were in high demand in Europe as a result of the Industrial Revolution were cocoa, gum, skin, that's talking about hide and skin, cotton, rubber, and palm produce. However, some Africans and others had questioned the idea of legitimacy given to this type of trade. This was because to refer to it as legitimate was to hide the truth that by the time of its introduction, Europe was more in need of raw materials from its industries than slave labor. For this reason, there was said to be nothing legitimate about the so-called legitimate trade. We go to the origin proper. Although there was also a serious campaign for the abolition of slave on moral grounds, the introduction of legitimate trade was informed by the need to provide enough raw materials to European factories following the Industrial Revolution. So that need for raw materials due to the Industrial Revolution was what necessitated this trade. After the formation of the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade in 1787, that's the 18th century, the economic potential of legitimate trade became a point of emphasis among the abolitionists. Now, the abolitionists are those that advocated for the end of slave trade. The idea of legitimate trade figured centrally in all abolitionist propaganda and testimony in parliament, such as in the mission of the new Syria Loan Company at its founding in 1791, and more broadly in Danish and French schemes to promote abolition. After the abolition of slave trade by Britain in 1807, Anglican evangelicals organized the African institution with the aim of encouraging staple crop production in Syria alone. The idea of a legitimate trade, apart from the desire for raw materials in Europe, would seem to have been a creature of the abolitionist movement and perhaps would not have existed without it. The implication of legitimate trade was that Africans were encouraged to abandon the hunt for slaves and take up commercial farming to meet the industrial need of Europe. So meeting up the industrial need of Europe was what was the basis of this particular legitimate trade. The raw materials enterprise resulted in new wars and the rise of wealthy commodity merchants in Africa. Like I said, merchants are successful traders. The legitimate trade started immediately after the abolition of slave trade. This does not mean that the European merchants were ignorant of the commodities involved in the legitimate trade until after the abolition of slave trade. In fact, Europeans' first contact with West Africa was not to buy slaves, but to buy commodities such as ivory, pepper, and gold. We go next to the nature of legitimate trade. After the abolition of slave trade, European merchants turned their attention to the trade in palm produce and other commodities. So the theme of this particular commodity was palm produce and other commodities. So the coastal areas of Nigeria had been noted for its rich production of palm oil, especially in the hinterland. The major commodities of legitimate trade were palm oil and palm kernels, which were used in Europe to make soap and as lubricants for machinery before petroleum produce were discovered and developed for that purpose. So importantly, palm oil and palm kernels were used in Europe to make soap 
So, and as lubricants for the machinery, you know, the lubricants helps the machineries to function well. And, you know, we use the soap to wash off all the filth and dirt from different things that are used by humans, whether household commodities or even industrial commodities. Attracted by this prospect, British, French, and German firms established their factories on the river along the coast. This included McLeaver, Miller Brothers, Thomas Harrison, Stewart, Douglas Hutton, and Cookson. By July 1882, in the 19th century, Consul Livingstone reported five great English firms doing immense trade in the Opobo River. The firms bought and exported palm produce and other commodities and imported manufactured European goods for sale to the local people. So you see that exchange and the quick swap. So in as much as they got raw materials from Africa, they eventually brought imported manufactured European goods for sale to the locals. Manila was the major currency used in the transaction. You know, before the advent of Manila, as means of exchange, we had trade by butter, then eventually we moved on to cowries and then Manila. Sometimes European goods were sold to African middlemen or given to them in trust. Now, this brings to fore the trust system, which enabled the African middlemen to collect European goods on credit. And after selling them, they paid back the agreed amount to the companies. This method was intended to encourage the middlemen or local produce dealers. Now, the need for complete eradication of slave trade, the promotion of legitimate trade, and the protection of the British nationals, notably traders and missionaries. You know, before we had the traders and missionaries, if you remember your history, previous history lessons, we talked about the adventurers or explorers, the likes of Mongo Park, which led to the discovery of River Niger. So we talk about these traders and missionaries who were the notable British nationals that needed protection, especially in relation to legitimate trade, led to the appointment of the British consuls to the Bights of Benin and Biafra, which became, rena became renamed the Bight of Boni in 1970. That's 10 years after Nigeria's independence. Now, these consuls embarked on intensive signing of anti-slave trade and protectionist treaties with the coastal chiefs. We end this lesson with the importance of legitimate trade, the importance of legitimate trade. It is important to note that the early European travelers to Africa were mainly interested in gold and spices, but later realized that slaves offered more profit. So initially it was gold and spices, and predominantly you remember your history when we talk about Gold Coast, now Ghana. So abundance of gold was in that West African subregion and spices, but later realized that slaves offered more profit. So for the businessman, for the merchants, for the European travelers to Africa, they realized that slaves had more profit rather than gold and spices. Up to the end of the 18th century, which is your 1700 to 1799, European trade with Africa was largely in slaves. So we can say trade in commodities were on the minimal side, but largely we had slave trade. Nevertheless, trade in gold and ivory, dye woods, gum, you know, those commodities were also very, very popular, but not in high demand as slaves were. By the late 18th century, shipping had grown more efficient, which meant that bulk commodities could be profitably traded, profitably traded so meaning that they could make more money from such trade in addition the industrial revolution was creating markets in europe for different african goods so that industrial revolution really helped to create markets in europe for different african goods now machines that needed lubrication which was provided by the oil and the additional ivory was used for billiard balls and piano keys and gum for clothes, dye, and medicine. Now you know that the billiard balls, when you talk about the popular snooker, and the piano keys were made from ivory. So, and gum 
as well as for cloth dye and medicine. So from 1820 and 1850, the increasing favorable terms of trade led to the demand for African export. Now, this demand was increasing, and so were the prices Europe was willing to pay. So while European industrialization was reducing the cost of exports, particularly of cotton textiles, new uses were found for vegetable oils, even when petroleum replaced them as an industrial lubricant. So cotton was exported from Egypt and West Africa and coffee from Angola. First, Sao Tome and Fernando Po exported cocoa, the Gold Coast and Cameroon. By 1910, the Gold Coast was the world's largest cocoa producer. East Coast Plantation produced sesame, copra, and grain. The taping of wild rubber trees developed from 1870. As a result of the legitimate trade, African countries became centers of economic activities. And eventually, the hostilities and warfare among Africans, largely as a result of slave trade, became increasingly reduced and peace gradually returned among African communities, a new era of utilization of African labor on the, comment, on the continent of Africa now commenced. So with that, we've come to the end of yet another history lesson. Today, we've been able to go on an adventure talking about the legitimate trade. So legitimate trade once again refers to the trade in commodities between Africans and European merchants immediately after the abolition of slave trade. So until we meet next time in the next history class, please make sure that you get informed about things that happened in the past so that you can make better choices in the present and eventually have a brighter future. I remain Mr. Ilori, your history teacher. Thank you.